What are cryptocurrencies? Hey, hey, hey. What are NFTs? A non-fungible token. Time to buy Bitcoin. Bitcoin just seems like a scam. What's up, what's up, what's up, what's up, what's up, Bitcoin? Hello everyone, welcome back to On The Ledger. This is your host Moel Said, and I'm back once again on your weekly rendezvous from Paris. One of the things that we've been hearing lately is that crypto is becoming part of culture. But what is culture? There are probably dozens of answers to this question. What's guaranteed is that culture is fluid. It is defined by what's relevant at a moment in time and embraced by communities. Historically, brands and media companies have always been shapers and amplifiers of culture. And with every new innovation that came about, the cultural landscape and its main acts were bound to change. From the TV to the internet, social media, and now Web3 and digital assets, every new innovation brings in new possibilities, opens the door for new players, and eliminates the slow movers. Web3 is only getting started, but we've already seen a glimpse of how it'll impact brands, media, and culture in general. So what exactly has changed? How are brands going to be any different? And what do they need to set themselves up for success? Stay with me, because today I've got two amazing ladies with an incredibly inspiring background in brand building and media who've probably got some answers for you. They've embraced Web3 early on, which has changed how they see and do things. First, we've got Joy Howard. I think the word marketing guru is overutilized, but in Joy's case, I'd have no choice but to use it. She's participated in building some of the most culturally relevant brands in the world, from Converse to Patagonia to Sonos and Lyft. But in 2021, Joy decided that it was time to build her own project and founded Early Majority, an inclusive brand that makes gear for getting outside. We'll be joined by none other than Ariel Wengroff. Ariel is a master of storytelling. She's an Emmy-nominated executive producer, advised she interviewed prominent figures such as Barack Obama, and has also produced a Netflix animation. But most importantly, Ariel is Ledger's VP of Communication. Last year, she decided to leave everything behind and come join the Web3 revolution in Paris. She'll be telling us all about it in a minute. Joy, Ariel, welcome to On The Ledger. How's it going? Great. So good to be here. So good to be here with y'all. Yeah, such a fun day. Yeah, I actually can't believe that, Ariel, it's your first time on the podcast. uh, And, you know, we can do it with Joy. So uh, I'm actually super excited for this episode. So let's get to it. This is On The Ledger, Season 2, Brands and Media in Web3. Here we go. So, Ariel, let me start with you. If I had told you a year ago that you'd be moving to Paris to work at a crypto company and collect JPEGs, what would you have said to me then? Well, I think, first of all, uh, my partner would have thrown you out the window. (laughs) But (laughs) but I I don't think it would have been uh, in my mind. I think a year ago, I was thinking the way that the ecosystem is set up does not value the individual that is putting in most of the work. Um, If you think about the history of business, it celebrates people who do probably the least amount of daily engagement in that thing. And I was actively working on trying to create better solutions for them. So Web3 really came to me as a vehicle for allowing the individual to feel like they have more than their voice in the product they can actually have profit and value for the way they spend their time in their life. And when I found Ledger, it was a really exciting way to bring that forward for the communities that we serve and the partners that we get to celebrate by by taking that step with us. Yeah, that's kind of the interesting thing there for, you know, everyone that's coming out of the media industry and everything related to marketing. That's a layer of engagement in Web3 that's really different. You get to be, you know, creating something with the community itself. And Joy, you know, you're pretty interested in Web3 as, as well. Um, I'm wondering what kind of ignited that interest? Yeah, I think, you know, I think it's taken a while for me to to become interested. And, and I've had a, I had a couple of like early interactions with the space that I think are really important to hold on to because it's really important to empathize with people who were just coming into the space and sort of like what that was like. And, you know, my first, I think my first real substantive interaction with Web3 was a DM that I got from Ian Rogers right before a party at my place. And he sent me, you know, two or three, he sent me a screenshot of like a bid that he just lost on OpenSea, a link to FWB and an article about Ether. And it was just like, I didn't get, and it was unintelligible, you know? And it was, I didn't even talk to him about it when I saw him because I was just like, I don't even know what he's talking about. Like, it just doesn't even make any sense to me, you know? 
And then I had an interaction when we just started Early Majority. Um, I crossed paths with Paul Tao, who runs events for Friends with Benefits. And he, um, you know, basically, you know, shared with me some of what FWB was doing with Zora. And that was interesting to me. That was the first thing where I was like, okay, I'm really interested to learn more about this because NFTs just didn't resonate with me. And I, the onboarding process was so onerous that I just gave up. You know, I tried to, you know, set up an account on Coinbase and it couldn't recognize my passport. And two or three times when I would like find the time to onboard, I just, you know, you know, and then I had to get a token and all that. So, you know, I really just sort of, you know, it, it was, we did actually mint our first NFT in May. So shortly after we met Paul, we put it up for auction on foundation. We wrote a newsletter about our experience, which I encourage you guys to read. It's in our newsletter tools for leaning out. So it's actually our third issue that we published was called NFTs. And it talks about how we felt doing it, you know, what we learned from it um, and, and also how fun it was. And I think that's what has brought me back to it, honestly, because it, was, it wasn't really until I went to Ledger Open and saw who you had convened there that I realized something special was happening. And um, yeah, I've just been learning as much as I could ever since ever since that interaction. All right, interesting. So Ledger Open was the was the aha moment. So as someone who's you know been working with the biggest companies in the world, Joy. How do you think it's going to impact their business models? I think it, well, that is the crucial question, how it will impact their business models. And what what I don't think we see happening yet is anyone actually addressing the opportunity to yes. transform their business models with these tools. And to me, that's what needs to happen. So I, you know, I, we're working in the apparel space. The business model of apparel has not changed for hundreds of years. It is so backwards and so destructive to the people that work in it and to the planet you know the environmental impact most people think about okay supply chain and apparel is terrible you know working conditions you know pollution but not many people understand that the carbon footprint of apparel is worse than all of maritime shipping and international flights combined and that's for stuff half of which will end up in the landfill in a year so half of everything that's made ends up in the landfill in a year so how can we use the tools of blockchain to, to solve that it's a fascinating question that gets right at the heart of the business model so i think you know one other thing i would just say about how it's going to affect business models and i really commend you for asking that question is that few people understand how little innovation has actually happened in the tech space because of the consolidation of big tech platforms. One of the reasons that I wanted to go into apparel is because I just felt like it's impossible to innovate in the consumer space given the market power of big tech right now. So I wanted to go into a market that's not winner take all, where these big platforms weren't dominating. And a lot of what I wanted to build in terms of business model innovation I could see that that's what people were doing with Web3 communities. You know, we wanted to go to market with a community model, with a membership model, so that we could get out of this whole skew proliferation madness that really drives growth in apparel. And what you see are people actually creating, you know, viable community-based business models within the Web3 space. I think it's incredibly powerful. And I don't see many people doing that yet. You know, I see everyone struggling to get their NFTs out there. A lot of like ham-fisted, you know, sort of, uh, hurry up, you know, all efforts that just, you know, aren't that impactful and are kind of one and done. Kind of like our first one was as well, where we just were like, okay, let's mint NFT. <laughs> okay, whatever, you know, <laughs> it's not what it's all about. <laughs> yeah, but I think you hit it kind of on the head, which is that, like, if you think about it from the digital media side, which ended up being the digital consumer side, the consolidation and duopoly of big tech made it such that as community models were emerging and influencer models were emerging, the response was, how do I own those people and their communities for the cheapest amount of money possible? Versus thinking, well, how do I make these individuals that are satellites for their communities a part of our long-term plan? And that's why Web3 is so interesting from a business model case perspective, because it's inherently against the way that most businesses have been trying to think about like what their return on investment is for the last five or 10 years. And when people are very nervous about that shift, I think in the same way that you could say big businesses were around direct to consumer, they lose out on the trend and then they're just playing catch up, right? Like big businesses that jump in now, you see a difference between something like a Playboy versus another brand. 
like I think Playboy's done a really good job of getting into the space, but you see some of these bigger brands coming in and it looks ironic and it looks tacky, or if like even how Budweiser interacted with the Discord. And so um, I think they're missing out on the core point. It's not trying to like flip the script in a pretend way. It's saying that the old way didn't work. And how can you how can you actually adapt to the new system or are you better just staying in your lane? Because that's also OK for some of these brands. Yeah, 100 percent. I think there is a big difference between the brands who are considering, you know, this space to be a new marketing stunt versus the ones who are really changing their business models. Exactly. Um, and I think like back to Joy's point, when you're talking about apparel and fashion in general, being able to, you know, put out a product and being perpetually re rewarded for the product that you've put out with minimum variable um, costs and with an engagement layer uh, for, you know, customer relationship management. It seems so obvious for all of these brands to start, you know, doing digital garments as well. And this is what we're seeing at the moment. Um, so Ariel, you know, back to the point of, you know, having the business model side and the marketing stunt side, uh, we've seen an impressive number of brands on board onto Web3 by experimenting with NFTs in 2021. And it's fair to say that it wasn't glorious for everyone, <laughs> like you've mentioned. Uh, in your opinion, what does a brand need uh, to be set up for Web3 success? If a brand is thinking about entering the Web3 space, which at some point, right, I think also another point that Joy made that I think is relevant here is when we do things every day, we don't talk about it like, oh, I'm so excited to get into the internet today so that I can utilize my computer. And then I can, you know, it's like, it's like, oh, I want to talk to my friends or I'm really excited to talk with Mo and I love seeing Joy's face. So this is like, we forget sometimes that the way that a brand works well is if a person feels like they're getting their voice back. And so the same thing exists for Web3. If you're going to jump into the space, think about the community that you're trying to activate. Think about the value that they get in return for their participation. And also, what does that mean over time? Like Web3 communities that are done well are not ones that are self-serving or one and done. There's something that is really thoughtful and it's community leaders that are willing to help each other out. And to the earlier point, most brands that exist from a Web2 or whatever we want to call it, traditional model, are thinking for more of a top-down ecosystem. So that's why it would make sense that, you know, loyalty programs or rewards businesses could have something that makes sense, right? Like influencers should have an influencer DAO, and you should be able to pay the DAO for the cross-functional influencer work that's being done. Because if you also think about like, I think we have to talk about what a Web2 brand can be because an influencer or a creator can be a Web2 brand. Like the average life of a TikTok star is 24 months. So what happens after that period of time to that person who's a creator? Shouldn't they be able to help each other or invest in X, Y, and Z? Or if you're Revolut Media and you're thinking about what it means to educate intergenerationally to change patterns for artists or musicians that are following you, then you should also teach them about smart contracts and IP ownership. And so there are trends that are emerging that have been discussions that we don't have to start from scratch on. And so I think also part of the problem is identifying someone as a Web2 brand or a traditional thing. Like some of the best brands that have entered the space like Time Magazine mm -hmm. are legacy brands. If you're a legacy brand and you have stayed on top, it's because you're willing to evolve. So we have to remove some of that also to let people enter the space if they're willing to, to try. Yeah, there are so many interesting things you said there. And I think there are many challenges brands need to overcome because if you think about it, brands have always outsourced creativity, most of them, um, to a certain extent and outsourced everything related to, you know, the production of the content and the, um, you know, the, the media side of things. But with Web3, you know, the situation most brands are in is that, you know, there aren't agencies out there that can do these stuff for them. Um, What's your take on that, Joy? Because, you know, I am I suppose you're having a lot of conversations with, uh, you know, different people from different brands. How are they approaching that kind of a Web3 aspect? So, okay, so I'm, I'm going to get to that question um, in just a minute, but I want to comment on something that Ariel said sure. first. And, and it is just really to highlight the power of something like smart contracts and IP ownership to just transform how people participate in creating brands. So, you know, you talked about the, you know, sort of life cycle of an influencer. I've worked a lot in action sports and so, and in the outdoor industry 
where literally, you know, you, you can be at the top of your game, whether you're a skateboarder or a climber and, you know, a few years into it, okay, what's going to happen at that point, you know, and, and it, it's, it's been such an extractive and exploitive space web web two has. And, and for artists, for all kinds of creators, it's just been, you know, a wash really like a whole decade. That's just been extractive loss of value creation, just a total wash. So the idea that that can actually be changed and transformed with these tools is really powerful. And really, you know, I think getting that message from the folks at Manifold and Lady Phoenix who spoke at Ledger Open, and if you haven't heard their talks, you definitely should listen to them, was very profound and, and eye-opening as someone who wanted to create a positive impact through business and has seen how extractive and exploitive brands can be in that space. It was very exciting. Um, you know, I think I think people are just and have been all year kind of all over the place, like running around like chickens with their heads cut off, trying to think about how to get into the space. <laughs> and I think sometimes it shows, you know, and, and so I think, you know, brands that do it well, they connect with the right people to do it well. And so, you know, if you listen to, you know, the folks at Time, like how they got started, they did it with with friends and partners who were who had had, you know, started to create the tools and were really native to the space and understood the potential. And that's exactly how we're going to do it. You know, we're going to do it through our friends, people that we meet, people that we trust who have put in the time and put in the energy to really understand. And we're going to listen and we're going to partner and we're going to do it very thoughtfully. And so, you know, I'm really lucky to know people at Ledger. I'm really lucky to be connected with Friends with Benefits. We've started to work with Seed Club, who I think are fantastic. And that's, you know, and and already, even in the first couple of conversations, I could see that the, some of the things that we wanted to do didn't necessarily make sense through the lens of someone who has so much. Think about the experience that someone like Seed Club has in terms of how many, you know, attempts that they've seen that have worked and that haven't. So it's, it's, you know, it used to be, okay, the whole data set belongs to Google and the data set belongs to Facebook and they do incredible smart things that nobody can understand with their data sets. And now the data set is in C club, right? And the data set is in your, your minds and what you're seeing and you want to share and you want to help other people grow. So it's just a, you know, it's a completely different model. And the last thing that I'll say about it is it's so much more transparent. So one of the other things that, and, and that can be scary sometimes, but it can also just be absolutely thrilling. And so I think another moment for me on my journey that really got me interested in the space was the ENS airdrop that happened, you know, and just trying to wrap my mind around, okay, what was that, you know, and, and, and seeing that appear in my wallet and, you know, trying to make sense of it was, was profound. Um, but even more profound was the SOS token. I don't know if you guys know about that. That was basically, you know, where, you know, people that were transacting on OpenSea didn't feel like they were being rewarded as part of the community. So they created their own token to monetize their own data. And if you, you know, that is so powerful. I mean, think about how much we've given to Facebook over the years and, you know, what we stand to benefit unless we've bought shares, we don't benefit at all. I just think this, you know, this notion that your actual consumer transaction data will be public and people can see what they've contributed to platforms as they consolidate is absolutely profound. Yeah, hundred percent. Like web two networks are kind of becoming web three economies and web two users are becoming web three owners. And I want to double click on the educational aspect of things because, you know, Ariel with Ledger, you've been working with, you know, a couple of big brands lately, uh, whether it be, you know, with Fendi or uh, Givenchy. Uh, could you maybe speak more um, to uh, that experience and how, um, you know, do you tackle these different elements, uh, whether it be education, onboarding, security? Well, what's amazing about a brand like Fendi, for example, or being part of LVMH is um, LVMH actually leads by supporting creativity. You can't create relevance or utility through something that doesn't have cultural interest and therefore product authority. And I think they've been really wonderful sort of arbiters of that um, in, in welcoming individuals into that. You know, they've actually celebrated, even if you look at Virgil before he passed, some of the greatest new creators of our time. Um, and so when you look at a brand like that and you think of how you can bring it into Web3, you actually celebrate the utility of bringing Web3 back into IRL. Like the partnership takes the Ledger hardware wallet and lets you showcase that you're a member of Web3 by using that together. And that's a really unusual offering together. And it's very different than what most people are doing, which to Joy's point are saying, like, let's just do something in the space to show that we acknowledge it exists. 
and more brands have to take the time to think about, well, what makes us relevant in the first place? How do we create demand? And no, and if you think about even like the way people in style describe Web3, I don't think anyone has done a great job of showcasing that need. And so we have to do our part to work with great brands to help bring them in, but also for them to bring their community into us. And those are the types of partnerships that count. And it's not about forcing a brand against where their nature currently is. Like if you looked at the Fendi drop, it looked so good on the runway because it's fe- it, it looked like Fendi, right? Like it made sense. It wasn't trying to fit something in that couldn't stand out. Um, and, and that's important. I really agree with that. And a couple of things I just want to kind of um, underscore that you talked about. Um, one is this whole sense of 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 being a part of something and 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 the sort of like sense of belonging that that one gets when one connects in a brand community if it's being done well and if it's done right. And um, I have a friend that said to me recently, the opposite of big isn't small, it's special. Mm-hmm. And I thought, wow, that's like that pretty much hits the nail on the head. The other thing that I would say, you know, in terms of education is that it's, you know, I think it's long been known that the best brands don't promote, they educate. And so, you know, the way to really be appreciated by someone is is really to be useful. And this is such a, you know, if you do something that's really rooted and, you know, authentically in your business using these tools, then then you can be useful and and you will be rewarded for that in the end. Um, one of the other things though, about education that I think it's really important to talk about is, um, and that I haven't really heard anyone in the web, uh, although Web3 in some ways on its own is an attempt to rebrand what we would call rebrand the category mm-hmm. um, and 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 it sort of getting away from some of the negative kind of like, mm-hmm. you know, creepy basement vape store vibes that crypto has kind of like, <laughs> you know, around it. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, not to go on too much about open, but I think that was one of the first moments where I saw someone actually try to rebrand the category. And I think it's going to be really important that that brands take a leadership role in rebranding the space. And I'll give you a cautionary tale from my own experience, which is basically rideshare. You know, Uber was the market leader. They were, I I mean, just like a pretty much a reviled, universally reviled brand. And that's what the category became synonymous with over time. In reality, there was so much goodness that the category unlocked, but because you know, no one really took on, you know, head on the issues of the gig economy. You know, is it predatory? Is it not? You know, is rideshare creating congestion? Is it not? And no one really spoke to the benefits of the ways in which rideshare could really unlock the city for people who couldn't experience it in that way before. You know, that high ground was never, I think, never really seized by anyone. And I think the whole category suffered as a result. So I think it's really, really important, you know, when you have things, you know, when you have you know, Matt Damon, for example, like taking a major brand hit because of the backlash against the space, you know, that that's like that. I think that should be a call to action for everyone who's in the space to to work very proactively to educate and basically try to help people understand what the benefits of the category can be and to, and to do useful work with the tools. No, I, I just think you're so right. Um, and I it's really interesting because being in the space and seeing the difference of four months People are starting to get a sense or they want to attach their name to it in a way that's different. But there is so much opportunity for people to to just really misunderstand who's in it and what they're fighting for. And I experienced that so much more than I think even to the point of like more women being in crypto. Like I know a lot of great women in crypto, but they're not the ones that maybe have the loudest voices on Twitter. Right. So um, I think it's a it's a big opportunity to be to be aware of for sure. 100%. And, you know, you've mentioned pushback. um, And speaking of that, you know, there is a lot of pushback happening at the moment um, with regards to NFTs specifically um, from a variety of, you know, different prominent and tech oriented media. In your opinion, you know, why do you think that is? What's driving the backlash? Yes. I think I think I think actually a lot of the marketing is being very destructive to the space, you know, because it's so that, you know, there's an expression, you know, there's sort of like a very critical expression in the ad industry, which is, um, you know, when you see work that's bad, you say your brief is showing, which is sort of like a play on your underwear. But really, it's like, okay, you can you can just see straight through to what the brief was. And I think so much of the brief is showing to the extent that marketers are really trying to target 
you know, the, you know, the sort of risk loving nature of young men, you know, their lack of inhibition, you know, all the reasons why we may have like a certain age for a driver's license or a certain legal drinking age, you know, you have marketers and advertisers just completely flouting that and saying like, you know, let's, let's go for it. And I think that, you know, that, and that's also why they chose Matt Damon, right? Because he appeals so much to young men. Um, and so I think, you know, the message has got to change it because otherwise it's just going to be this, you know, self-reinforcing um, positioning that you don't want to have, I think, for the category. Could not agree more. I mean, I just think so much of the push right now is about quick gains versus actually thinking about a habitual change. Mm -hmm. Like most of it is how do we make it seem like we are close to something you are used to, but you could get more out of it. And the reality is, is like, Okay, how, what is, I actually see a lot of, of the work being done right now making me feel like original credit card ads. Like, this is something really exciting that you as a young adult have access to, and it empowers you to live your life in a different way. And yet, in a few weeks from now, you might not realize that you've spent things that feel like play money in a way that is a material impact on your life, right? So that, that to me, is the biggest um, cringe moment that I have when I look around at it. Yeah. yeah. And there are stories. I mean, there are there are very positive and transformative stories. I mean, you know, the people who have drawn me into the space are artists, former community organizers who've been really, really active in creating some of these new communities. Those kinds of stories or even the, you know, the, the, the two women in Georgia, basically, that saved their farm with the, you know, dastardly ducks, NFTs, you know, that's that's an incredible story. They've been, you know, I think had a lot of backlash on Twitter about having done that, which is so patronizing and so destructive. I think up uplifting the stories that, you know, show other ways of using cryptocurrency, of using the blockchain, of using the tools of Web3 are really important. Yeah, and it seems like this is something that's actually part of human nature. You know, I was kind of researching this and you had, you know, back in the 90s, you had articles about how the Internet is a fad and how, you know, the Internet's impact is never going to be higher than the facts and a lot of people pushing back on the Internet. And I feel like I'm getting the same vibe. You're getting, you know, a lot of, you know, big gaming companies that are supposed to be getting what NFTs are all about. It's about digital ownership and portability and the open metaverse. And it all makes sense. But at the same time, you have a lot of pushback from people who should be getting it. And this is where I'm like, okay, there is something happening there. But to your to both of your points, we need to brand it in a way that is actually useful and not only about, you know, speculation or, you know, what, how we say like the degen kind of way of, uh, you know, participating in that economy. I think a lot of that has to do with people not appreciating how important is and having fun is to invention and creativity. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, it so much of social innovation has happened as a result of our just playing and having fun. And I think that's what I think from the outside, especially you don't see like, you know, I, I've learned so much, but none of it felt like work. I mean, onboarding and, you know, like getting my first account set up felt like work. But as soon as I did that, there are all these little moments that are just fun and playful. And that's kind of what keeps you engaged, I think, in a positive way. So I think, you know, that people don't appreciate how important that is and, and kind of underestimate it. And one example I think of all the time with respect to this is how when, you know, the App Store has unleashed so much creativity, but when it first started, nobody knew what it was for. And one of the biggest apps was this thing called the beer drinking app, which is basically was like an app where you could just hold your phone up and it looked like you were drinking beer. And how ridiculous was that, you know? And, you know, that's how it started. And today I get turn by turn biking instructions through Google Maps on my iPhone, you know, delivered right into my ear as I'm biking around Paris. I mean, that is mind blowing. It's incredible. And it started with, you know, just a bunch of playful, seemingly stupid stuff. I want to move on to another topic that you've actually both partly touched on. Um, it's women in Web3. And, you know, Web3's ethos lies, um, you know, within decentralization and inclusivity. However, the space has kind of fallen short of attracting women, or at least of highlighting the women that have been doing great work in that space. Um, how do you think we could change that? I mean, I think humans don't typically like change. And when change happens, there's unnecessary language and nomenclature. And feeling like you know something other people don't makes it easier to embrace something new. Um, and that traditionally does not include 
um, minorities or it, it creates gender problems, right? And, you know, women are over half the population. And so uh, we're not a minority. I think if you're talking about Web2 conversations that have happened over, over the last many years, it's something that emerges over and over again in time. Um, and yet I find within Web3, I'm connected to a ton of incredible women in the space um, through crypto packaged goods or through BFF, which just launched recently. And I think what you see is that women uh, women are just working, right? Like women are doing their work to, to bring other people in and to get their job done. And they're maybe not as loud on social and, and we have to take more work to get folks incorporated and integrated and to bring a friend in and, and make it active. But um, I think that also women have, what I love about what's going on with Web3 is it's also breaking down the kind of previous conversations and risks around talking around money. Because if you're talking about an NFT and you're talking about the cost in ETH, you're stripping away what used to be done when you're talking about money. And I think that's so important for women. And so when you look at what's going on with Web3 from STEM, technology and finances, those are traditional spaces that women have historically stayed away from although they've always done great work in. And so we have a lot of work to do while we bring uh, female identifying people and, and others into the space to make it feel comfortable. What's your take on that, Joy? Oh, I just, I, I couldn't agree more. And, um, you know, a, uh, the UX has got to improve because women often just don't have the time. Like, I, I just can't underscore what you said, you know, more emphatically. So that, So it has to get easier. It has to get more useful. For us, you know, there have to be useful experiences, fun experiences. Uh, but I think the biggest barrier right now is UX. And, um, you know, part of why I feel so strongly about being involved is because I think when it comes to technology, it's you either you're sh you shape it or you shape by it. And it's a much more powerful stance to be a shaper than it is to be shaped. And, you know, what we saw happen with Web2, I was in the music industry, you know, in like, 90s early 2000 and you know because the music industry and all musicians basically put their heads in our in the sand like we you know we we screwed up you know it's like okay wow half of the value of that entire industry got wiped out you know between 2000 and 2010 just because we weren't trying to understand how to use the tools what could they mean for us so i think it's really important to to not be disempowered and to make the space to learn because actually once you get in there it's really fun and um, and and can lead to supportive community, which is what we need the most. You know, women are very exhausted a lot of times because of productivity culture. It's exhausting for men. But and I think this is happening a lot in the Web3 space, too. People a lot of times seem very tired and exhausted because there's this whole, you know, kind of FOMO aspect to the marketing that happens. And, you know, there's a huge emergent culture around the joy of missing out. So, you know, let's stop with these kind of like, oh my God, you know, you've got to be in the discord every five minutes to get on the whitelist and you're never going to get to participate if you don't. It's like, who has time for that? You know, people should just like, it's going to be available for at least two weekends, right? Because you need the weekend, you know, as the time to do it. So I think we can change the UX. I think we can change some of the ways that we're marketing. And also, I think we can just encourage each other to be there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great point. And I think, you know, not to put additional responsibility on your shoulders, but it's great to have, you know, figures such as yourselves as well, you know, being there and, and you know, women can empathize and and they can resonate with your with whatever you're putting out there so so you know that's that's something to underline as well so it's time to move uh, on to our last segment of the show this is rapid fire so we usually like to finish on a more playful note so i'll be asking you a list of rapid fire questions that you'll answer in turn uh, some of them will be harder than others but the whole idea is that you shouldn't think for too long okay are you ready yeah. Um, cool. So let's start with Joy. What's something you wish you knew last year? Something I wish I knew last year? Yes. Oh, I mean, I wish I knew everything that I know now about Web3 last year. I wish I knew it back in May <laughs> instead of learning it in December. <laughs> Fair point. What about you, Ariel? I wish I knew French last year. That would help me out a lot right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so second question. Um, Joy, what is who is your most inspiring Web3 figure? Probably Alex from Friends with Benefits, the mayor of Friends with Benefits. I'm really, I loved his interview with you and I'm super inspired by what they're doing. And I'm really, really excited to be a part of it. Yeah, we love Alex. Ariel. 
Um, I would have to say it's a tie between my crypto packaged goods community because they are my school and my friends now. And, and honestly, Ian, because he sucked me in. Uh, I, I owe a lot of pain and credit to him for this. Yeah, we, yeah, Ian's super inspiring, no doubt about that. Uh, so, Joy, what about your favorite NFT collection? I'm I'm really this is I hope it's not too obscure but I'm really into this um newsletter called Dirt which is NFT funded it's kind of like the first NFT funded newsletter so that's probably my favorite I love both of the writers and um I love that they're trying to make that happen in that way Okay what about you Ariel I love my boss beauties I'm banking on the long run for them Okay yeah they're pretty cool Um so Joy your favorite web3 brand initiative Oh uh, well probably Pool Suite Okay All right. Could you maybe explain uh, what Pool Suite is to those who don't really know? Pool Suite is, I think, uh, I think they describe themselves as an internet leisure economy, and I think that that you know, just back to having fun. It's it, it's just it feels it, everything about engaging with them just feels really really fun and energizing. And so I think that they found a very natural way to do that and to extend that experience into Web three. You know, and I think. You know, a company that makes like sunscreen one month and then, you know, launches an NFT membership program a few months later, like you have to respect that. 100%. Ariel. I actually would have also said Pool Suite. <laughs> I absolutely I think that they are a uh, web3 URL company that activates the five senses. And how rare is that? So that one is a bit harder. What about the most cringe initiative? Oh my god. I mean, oh, I have yeah. two on that. You go first Shoot. then. Let's Sorry. Go. Um, also, I have to tell you that I really like this NFT collection. Af um, oh, I think it's called Afropunks. You should check it out. Okay. Yeah. Second thing, um, uh, cringe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I actually think that what Adi did was really cringe, Adidas, uh, because it just seems so rushed. And it, you know, I think if you really tried to go through the experience online, there were a lot of like broken links and it just... I don't know. It just felt like one of those kind of like hurry up offense moves. Like we got to catch up with Nike. We got, you know, blocked out of that acquisition. And like, you know, it just, I just reeked of like haste makes waste to me. And then I think the other one is this or is me I don't know if you know about, they had a big backlash online yesterday because of a the day before yesterday, because they did a collab with board eight. Okay. And I just thought it was like, man, such a sort of very ham fisted, very bro move. I really didn't expect Adidas to be on the list, but it's interesting. It's interesting for sure. What's your take on that, Ariel? Um, well, I, I, I guess first I would say I, I understand that because I think there is always this fight in the categories of like, well, how do I show that I've got something planned there mm -hmm. too? And I think that that's kind of one of those moments. Um, but it goes back to your point about UX because I think If that had happened and it had been a horrible UX, there were a lot of delays, but I think it probably would have gotten more pushback. And um, I would say for me is actually Budweiser. Mm -hmm. I think that they launched and people were so excited and I actually got in to be an OG Bud. And then as an OG Bud, you got nothing. And I think that they just really didn't realize that you actually have to take care of the people that are signing up for something. And you could have been so playful with that. There are so many ways to actually have fun. And if you're like Budweiser has actually done a traditional has had tradition of some really great ads, some really great ways to make it feel like every person gets to be a part of their family. And then they kind of just set up their Web3 actions to fail. So that was disappointing to me. Yeah, I think Pepsi should be in there as well. But that's my personal yes. touch. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, what what excites you the most about the future? Go I ahead. think Web three is very fun. For um, we didn't speak as much about international mm -hmm. today, and the idea that you can do a meetup and be from many different countries, I think, is really exciting. And even if you talk about sort of like the gender aspect from before, I love the idea that a city in the states could be a sister city in Web three to another part of the world. And that you could maybe sponsor even kids or people in different places. Like there's such youth have such a quick adaptation. And I also do think that because of sometimes the anom uh, anonymity of Web3, that one thing we, we don't talk about as much is actually the proliferation of the career of, of aging 
and how individuals could be of different ages and really starting or rehabbing their careers. And I think Web3 is a great opportunity at the beginning and end of that cycle to allow for uh, more diversity in that regard as well, which is much needed. Yeah, it's a very interesting point. And we've had that discussion, Joy, uh, when when we first met about avatars enabling, you know, people to be completely emancipated from the physical biases. So, you know, no matter your age, sex, you know, skin tone, religion, if you wear an avatar and you're able to put out ideas out there that resonate with people, then, you know, it works. Uh, anyway, uh, what about what, what about you, Joy? Uh, it makes me very hopeful that people can find new ways to work together to solve problems, you know, because I think that was another thing that was great about Web2. I just watched, I'm watching this Netflix series, Don't Fuck With Cats. Mm -hmm. And what's amazing is the people, how the people work together, you know, to, to catch that killer and how much fun they had doing it, you know. And it just reminds me of like, oh, yeah, we were all supposed to collaborate in this space, right, and create cool things together. And so I'm I'm hopeful that I'll continue to be excited by you know communities that do that like i've got really excited about crypto bats ozzy osbourne's thing that he did you know and and that was just so fun to watch and so unexpected and you know just so delightful and i'm hopeful that we're going to find ways to solve actual environmental problems with the tools of web3 so i think you know there's two aspects to apparel that i think hold a lot of potential one is provenance, and I think blockchain can play a really important role in that. And the other is driving circularity, and we're going to really be focused on trying to do that. So um, I'm very excited about the possibility of that. Okay. Yeah. Make me laugh because um, there was, I remember when Trump was still running and it was unsure if he would potentially win re election. There was people had this idea of like, well, what if we do a campaign that says that Trump hates cats? Because cat people are so intense that it would probably come out in droves against Trump for this and so i'm just like loving anyways yeah anyway, sorry mo but. <laughs> no but speaking of trump what about the things that scare you the most i think the scariest thing is the immutability of the blockchain and the whole idea that like you know if you make a mistake it's there forever mm -hmm. i think that makes people very anxious and afraid and i i you know i'm, I'm a big believer in restorative justice and, you know, there's a lot in our culture that works against that. So I hope that we can always create space for restorative justice in a world um, where this technology exists. That's what's most scary to me. Uh, to me, I actually think what scares me a lot in the sort of philosophy is actually who, who will get access first. Like the need states of Web3 and the blockchain are very different by location, by background. And I think there's a lot of... Um, misnomers around why you should be in the space. And even if I think about going back to the Trump point or politics, you know, Republicans accept donations in crypto, but Democrats in the states don't. And from I, I don't I don't philosophically as a Democrat understand that. So um, I'm really concerned about media adaptation of crypto. And I see it as a personal responsibility for leaders in crypto to talk about the fact that you know, I say this to my friends, everyone deserves to have the choice to not participate. And that is my biggest concern. That's a great point. And I think we've moved actually from wanting to bank the unbanked to actually unbanking the banked. But the technology why it existed in the first place is to, you know, just help all of these different, you know, regions in the world that don't necessarily have the necessary infrastructure to be able to, you know, basically have a financial life. Uh, but anyway, um, our last question, what would be your ultimate tip to a woman who just joined the space? I mean, mine would be to get a ledger and secure your, <laughs> <laughs> secure your crypto and uh, ask a friend any question you have. There's no stupid question in crypto. Mm -hmm. And any communities would you like recommend them to join? Yeah, that was going to be my first tip is actually to join World of Women yes. or BFF and to, mm -hmm. to just get in there and, and discover some of these empowering communities that are being created. Yeah, awesome. I echo that. Awesome. Any, any last words? You want to you wanna like give out to the community? I mean, thanks, Mo, and always a pleasure. Joy, can you tell um, our listeners where they can uh, sign up to subscribe to your newsletter? Oh, yes. Early majority on Substack. That's where you can find the newsletter. And if you sign up for the newsletter, you'll get updates about our launch, which will be happening imminently. Looking forward to that. Joy, Ariel, thank you so much. I really enjoyed this. And yeah, I'll be looking forward to our next chat. Thanks, Mo. Thanks, Mo.
That's it, a really inspiring glimpse into the future of brands and media in the era of Web3 with Joy Howard and Ariel Wengroff. If you've listened this far, please hit that subscribe button because we've got a lot more to come. This was On The Ledger from Paris with your host Moel Said. Till next time, take care. Au revoir. This content is provided for informational purposes only and is the sole expression of our opinion and should not be relied upon as legal, business, investment, or tax advice. Do your own research. Any loss or profit is your sole responsibility. Stay safe.